And, but if we were to just spend that just one moment asking the Lord to clarify things, he does actually do those things. You know that, beloved? He wants you to speak to him. He wants you to know him and uh, be willing to understand that he, his presence is always there for us. And tonight I am going to ask God to give me grace to get through this today. And it's a very short message. We should be here no longer than an hour and a half. And I guess, Yes, you just love being here for a long time. But um, no, it is actually fairly short. We're going to open our Bibles to Mark 2. This is where we're going to be doing uh, most of our uh, walking through the Bible today. I want to talk about a story that would help us actually learn to understand what is it that we do to try to, you know, what can we um, put into plan or put into play to try to reach others for Jesus. Uh, the series is called Hold Fast, Be My Witness. It's part two uh, tonight. And I believe that God can give us some insight tonight and some encouragement. And that's, that's what I'm banking on tonight. So let's just, uh, I just want to bow my head and just uh, ask the Lord to come. Hallelujah. God, we thank you and we praise you and we worship you, God. Oh, Jesus. We ask that you would come with your grace and the anointing and an open heaven for us one more time. We thank you, Lord, for showing up this morning. We ask for your presence one more time. Without you, God, it's just words. God, we need to understand these words, God. We need your Holy Spirit to come and just surround us and just uh, open our eyes and our hearts of understanding and our ears to hear tonight and just a willingness to just obey what you're asking us. God, I ask that you would just come, Holy Spirit. I need you tonight. I need you more than anything at this point. I need your grace. I need your power. I need your ability just to sustain me as I bring this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so tonight we're here, Be My Witness, part two. And we saw this morning that, God, that Jesus' last words in Acts 1-8 to his disciples is a mandate, a call, a commissioning for them to come and to be his witnesses. We had asked the question, what is it that God did? What did he, why did he leave us here on earth? Because so many of us, we don't actually put the two and two together. He could have just brought us right up to heaven, but he decided to leave us here so that we can actually be representatives, you know, just those that witness and testify of who he is. Uh, we saw the definition of the word witness this morning where it says one who has seen and heard something and one who furnishes the evidence of it. And so he uses people just like you and I to let other people know who he is. You know, we must do our part in this whole plan because God doesn't want to see anybody perish. And we actually are so greatly defined by our insecurities and our fears and those things that, you know, really don't really matter to God. All he wants is an individual, a vessel that is willing to just speak up and just be that light for those that are so in need of an answer today. And so we're going to see today... Um, in the story of Mark 2, 1 to 5. And from this story, we will learn a few lessons on evangelism. And we're going to pull it out. So let's open up. We have it on, on, uh, on the slide as well, for those that don't have their Bibles. So a few days later, when Jesus again entered Cap Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered, and then lowered the, the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. The miracle story of Mark 2 is a powerful one. Jesus confounds his critics. He confirms his divinity when he tells, uh, tells the paralyzed man to stand, to get up and get off his mat and walk. And each time I read this story, there's a sense of humor that I find in that story when Jesus is teaching and all of a sudden there's, there must be no, you know, when somebody is, 
you know, digging on the roof, there has to be some things falling down. And we kind of know, like, have, have you ever, like, been up here, and then you're, you're talking, and all of a sudden the roof, you know, the things are all falling down because people are digging up there. And, and you know, I, I think about all of the people who couldn't even step aside knowing that this man wanted to come first. I mean, they were coming, four men holding the mat, bringing them close to the house, but nobody wanted to move. They were there to see the Messiah. They were there to hear him. They didn't want to give room to anybody. So these four friends did whatever they needed to do to bring them to Jesus. And here, apparently, Jesus, people started stepping aside and letting him come. But the stunning element of this story is the activity of the friends who carried this man to Jesus. I think there are three principles that we can pull out of these brave, unnamed individuals. We don't know their name, and we don't hear of them again. But I believe we can pull out some things that we need to hear, and we need to maybe uh, you know, bring forth in our lives. The first one that I get from these unnamed individuals is they had a plan. One part of this story that it's easy to overlook is that the four men were carrying Jesus, carrying their friends to Jesus. Have you ever tried to get four men on the same page to do a task? Or, oh, come on, guys. Uh, I, I mean, I work with a lot of contractors here. And I, just, just the other day, mind you, I have to tell you, I have really willing men in this church. I, I am so blessed the other day. I just went, help. Can somebody help me help bring me the, the, the photocopying machine downstairs? Well, I took some pictures, which I will not show tonight. But it's just like, and here, these four men were trying to figure, and they all had their plan, and they all had their ways of bringing down this photocopy machine. And the only thing I was worried about is just don't break it. <laughs> just don't break it. But it was cumbersome, and they were trying to figure out, okay, let's turn it this way. And, okay, no, let's just do it this way. We're going to slide it this way. And you should have heard the grunting and the trying to figure out how to bring They succeeded. I haven't checked out if it was still working, uh, but, <laughs> but they succeeded. It was actually pretty amazing. But this is what we need to hear about this story. These four men got together thinking of one thing together, wanting to get their friends to Jesus at whatever cost. And I know, I know, seeing my volunteers do what they did, I know that if anything does happen, I can ask and again see you guys be at play and just do what you need to do. Now, we know sometimes to get volunteers, it helps. It, it, it kind of takes sometimes some time to put it all together. And sometimes some free pizza. I mean, anything to get them here. Food. Food works really well, I find. But now I know that I don't want to, you know, make this story more than what it is, but I, I really do believe that we must realize that if we're willing, if we want to introduce our friends to Jesus, we need a plan. We need a plan. Every person that we're going to be talking about, they're different. And the way that you're going to approach them will be different as well. One thing works for one, but not necessarily for another. And so it, the, the encounter has to be unique to that individual. And I believe these four friends understood that this, this, their friend needed an intervention. They needed to bring him however and how, uh, how strong they needed to be. They were going to do that for their friend. And, but we need to realize and ask ourselves, why is our friends or my friend not a Christian? Why is someone in your family not a Christian? Now, there are times we know that it's a lack of adequate knowledge. They don't know the heart of the gospel. They don't know what they're missing. They don't see their needs, so they lack adequate knowledge. They're, sometimes they have had a bad experience. People who have maybe not had much wisdom had spoken to them about the church and about Jesus and about God in such a way that for them it was really, it left them with a bad taste. It had a bad experience. You have some that when you tell them about Jesus, it, they just outright reject the belief. They reject it and they don't like the life requirements that comes with it, the change that comes with it. And in others, it's just apathetic. That means they're, ap they're, they're just asleep. They don't really care. They want to settle. They don't care. But when we know why our friends are not Christians, if we know ahead of time what's really tugging at their hearts, when we have spent time praying for them, we have spent time spending time with them, we start kind of understanding that maybe there are certain things that we have to actually do differently. Like these friends, they had a plan. 
For example, if my friend had an adequate knowledge of the gospel but doesn't want to change his life, then it's not a problem of apologetics. It's not a problem about belief in how you are presenting the gospel. It's that they don't want to change their lives. And I remember with my sister, I had an adequate knowledge of what the gospel was. And for years, she spoke to me. And at one point or another, I just kept on telling, stop preaching at me. After a while, she started realizing that I was shutting down when she would always talk to me. And I'd say, well, you know, you can't, can't you not just be my sister? And so she took a different approach. She stopped actually bringing the gospel message and telling me about God, and she started writing me letters. Little did she know those letters I kept. And whenever I was down and suicidal, and when I felt that I couldn't, I couldn't breathe anymore, I would go to those letters to actually hear what, what she had to tell me about God. And it was those letters that in the end of the end that got me to come to her church so that I could hear the gospel being preached at, to me. And so there are times that we do have to stop preaching. There are times we just have to be the life and the testimony for them. Our life is a testimony. So my sister, her life was a testimony for me. Why? Because she was a young woman who had been so rejected and beaten and betrayed that she was very um, needy. But when the Lord came, she became radiant and joyful and gracious. And it was just, I couldn't put my finger on. And she kept on saying, and I said, well, it's just that church thing. And she says, no, no, it's not church. I got a relationship with God, Mona. And he's changed me and he's changing the way I look at life. And I would go, oh, here she goes again. But I was listening. I was listening because her life actually demonstrated something that I knew she was not before. Are you hearing me? She was not those things. 1 Timothy uh, 6, 12 says to us, because you know, my life and testimony becomes a vital plan, part of the plan for God. And sometimes we might not be able to preach or talk about the gospel, but our life is, is a vital part of that plan. Do you understand that? Sometimes we dismiss our life. Never dismiss your life. Never dismiss the small things that you do, the small beginnings that you do with your friends and those that are around you. In 1 Timothy 6, 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Think about those in your life right now. Do they know Jesus? Why are they still not believing? Have you pondered what is it that they've experienced before? What is your plan to address them in that unique way that you need to address them? Because sometimes we, 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 we beat the horse. and <laughs> Stop beating the horse. There's a different way. Maybe you, they need you to do things for them. Maybe they, want to, they need help just by just being, having somebody with them. Just change your approach, have a plan, find out what's really bothering them and actually speak to them or let your life speak to them. That brings me to the second point that we can get from Mark 2, from these unnamed men. They overcame a problem. As the friends approached the house, they realized that they had a problem but refused to allow the problem to deter them. I imagine they tried ways to get through the door in many ways, but they couldn't. So breaking someone's houses down is not something that I'm asking you to do to get, to, to, to get them to think about Jesus, because I don't think it would work well for you today <laughs> if I decided to go to Conrad's home and break all his windows to get his attention. No, it's not going to work. But so maybe that worked then, but what these men are showing us is that they didn't let the problems deter them in speaking truth to, the, to, uh, to bring this man to truth. Um, when, so when we know there are things that we need to determine, then we must go forth and not worry about the problems that we face. Evangelism always requires determination. Keep this in mind. This is what we always struggle with. It is, it is always easier not to share Christ. I know, there are times. It's easier just to be quiet. It is more comfortable to stay silent. There are always reasons why now isn't the best time. You always have something else you, you could be doing at that moment. These excuses will always come up, but remember, we are not plan B, we're plan A. We're part of what, how God is going to reach those that we love, those that are in our vicinity, either it be co-workers, home family, or neighbors. 
And this brings me to uh, this quote here. If we're going to bring our friends to Jesus, then we cannot give up too quickly. Don't give up. My sister never gave up. Nine years. Nine years did she speak of me, of her relationship with God and what God had done for her, that her life spoke to me. But I was stubborn. I had, I had rejection issues, and I was stubborn. There will be times when the words flow freely as you speak to someone and times it'll be hard and you will think that you blew it, but you need to understand, don't ever think that you were alone in this process. The Holy Spirit is always with you. But in every evangelistic encounter, be prepared to overcome obstacles because there are going to be many. Remember who is the prince of the air. There's going to be many. We need to press through them. Don't give up on the people around you. Trust the Lord to use your efforts to accomplish his will in their life. And what is their, his will? Is that they'd be saved, that they would come to a saving knowledge of what his son did for them. And that brings me to the point number three. Number three is that they understood their role. Without the help of his friends, the paralyzed man was hopeless. We don't know much about his physical condition, but we do know that they, he couldn't get to Jesus on his own. Is that right? Couldn't walk. He was on the mat. He couldn't get to Jesus on his own. It is evident that these men loved their friend. They wanted him to get up and walk, but, this, but his healing was not within their power. There are times it's not within your abilities. It is actually, it's within God's ability. They needed to get him to Jesus. So you need to ask yourself, how do I get those that I have in, in my life? How do I get them to Jesus? You have to have a plan. You have to know that you're going to have to overcome some problems. But here you also have to know that the Bible teaches us this. In 1 Timothy 2, this is good and pleasing, uh, and pleases God our Savior, who wants all man to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And in Romans 10, 13 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. So we see the heart behind it. God is trying to awaken us so that we can understand our part, our role in these individuals that are in our life. Do you really believe that where you are is a mistake? That it's a coincidence? That God brought you there? I say to my kids now that they're all gone to going to uh, the, 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 the college. I mean, do you really think God got four of you to go to the same college for no reason? Oh my goodness, I'm going to pray for them. Because I really truly believe God is on the move. Now let me show you why I know that is true. You see, your role is to share Christ with your unbelieving friends, your family. You're not their savior. But your role is to plant seed. Some is to plant, others to water. And we know that God is the one that gets the increase. He's the one that brings the harvest. But this is what we see in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. This is about the whole episode with Paul and Apollos. He says, what, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? They are only servants. We are only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned each his task. You see, God has assigned your task. Now, when we make it about the disgruntled employees, when we make it about the environment, when we make it about the situation, we kind of lose sight of your task, our role. And we must come back to this main role. God left you here so that you can be a witness to the people who are around you. And I don't care if it's just a smile. I don't care if it's just you being sensitive enough just to ask the question, how are you doing? Sometimes people just feel all alone, and that's all they need to know is that somebody cares enough to ask, how are you doing? And so we see here in verse 6, I planted the seed, this is Paul, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. And so we need people who plant and people who water. And there are times I'll water, and several months later, someone else is, uh, is some, I'll seed, I should say, I plant a seed, and someone else will come to water it. And then before I know it, several years down the road, they are coming to the Lord because these seeds have been planted. Our unbelieving friends are like the paralyzed man in the story. Left to themselves, they are unable to get to Jesus. 
Before we can bring our friends to Jesus, we need to settle the fact in our hearts and minds that if we do not bring them, they will not likely not go to him. I remember a time when I was a very young uh, Christian and I was a nurse. I just got my position at the hospital and something was so defined in my heart that I knew that I was supposed to be there because I shouldn't have never gotten the job to start off with. And God had opened that door and I know my husband and his wonderful wisdom it just encouraged me to be attentive to what God is doing on the floor. There were many, many obstacles. I had many people because I was young, but I was an RN over, uh, over other older women who had been an, um, an RNA in Ontario that was well, LPNs, I guess. But so she, many of them were really disgruntled with all the newer nurses coming in, and I was one of them. And so right off the bat, there was many obstacles, but I remembered, I kept on saying, God, you brought me to this hospital for a reason. And little by little, I started recognizing little things that were happening. God was opening doors that I can plant seeds to people who were on their way, you know, who were on their deathbed or whatever. And, and I just experienced these, these, the, these moments of tugging by the Holy Spirit just to plant seeds. And sometimes I watered something that was already planted many years. And I remember I remember one particular uh, gentleman that I, there was a lot of obstacles going on, and I remember, you know, just sharing the gospel, and he came to Jesus, and, and he, he passed away many, many weeks later, but then that same week, I was on the other side of the floor, and there was a man who was in a semi-coma, and I heard the Lord say, speak to him in his ear, and tell him about me. Beloved, I didn't do it. I felt actually insecure because all of his family was there in the room, and I just didn't know how to go about doing it. And I was actually at the fear of man. And I remember saying, well, I'm on again tomorrow night, and I'll just go straight to his room and I'll, I'll, before the family comes in or whatever and talk to him about Jesus. Well, you kind of know how the story ends. I got in tomorrow night, <laughs> the evening after, and he was gone. And I realized that God could have actually awakened other people to go and speak to him. But that was a real clear indicator that I needed to understand that I had a role. I have a role. You have a role. And we must actually know how to go about it. We need a plan. We need to overcome the obstacles that are there. And we need to understand that we have a role in other people's lives. And so before I finish tonight, I... I want to tell you this verse is really clear for me, and it always has been, and it's a reminder for me all the time, and I want to share it with you tonight, and then I'm going to end. It's in Romans 10, verse 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Many of us are sent, but we're not hearing the voice of God because we're too busy building our own lives. And I have to really understand that for me, I am part of that plan of God to reach as many as I can when I can. Do I drop the ball? Definitely. Do I sometimes feel like I can't do it because I'm too overwhelmed? Yes, I do. Do I believe that these people will perish on my, uh, on my watch? Well, some will probably, but others won't because God, he said that he'll do everything he can to reach them. So if I fail, he's going to go to the next and the next and the next to cause us to want to plant the seed. You see, the planting of the seed, the watering of the seed is to awaken people. And there are times people get awakened because a story is told, because of, of, a, of a, a, a service that's done, just little things. And so we are part, just God's ordinary means to touch others for his kingdom. When you look at the commentary for this, it says, in God's ordinary means of operating, people do not come to saving faith unless they either read the Bible or have someone tell them the gospel message that is in it. It is the word of God that the Holy Spirit uses to awaken a response of faith within others. That's why you can't give up. 
Don't give up. Don't lose sight that even though you see nothing, keep on casting your seed. Keep on doing that with words, deed, and action. Trust that the Lord is doing what he needs to do. Do your part. He will do his. Don't let your environment or your situation or whatever that is around you dictate to you, take you off task or your role because your role doesn't get diminished because you're in a workplace that is hard to talk to Jesus, to talk about Jesus. No, beloved, you just have to hear. And God wants to use you to plant the essential seeds for the Holy Spirit to awaken them that one day, just like me, after nine years, seed after seed, every time that she would water them, my sister with her letters, I came to that place that day where I was ready to hear, receive, and to move forward in a new direction. We need to believe. We need to settle this in our in our hearts today, that God has called all of us right where we are, and he has a mission for you. He has, he has commissioned you in this workplace to bring the gospel, like I said, through word, deed, or action. Whatever God is asking you to do, if you are approaching someone and it's not working, then change your approach. If you see obstacles, don't let it cause you to lose sight that God has called you there. He has called you there. And remember your role is to be a witness for the one who has saved you. For me, I know without him, I, I, like I said, I say it all the time, and yet it doesn't diminish the powerful message that I do not know I, if I'd still be alive today. The path of darkness always leads you down the same path, death and destruction. But Jesus has come to give us life and life more abundantly. But without us, people will never come to that conclusion. So we we must not lose hope or get weary in doing good, beloved. Keep up the good work. Keep on speaking, keep on loving, keep on serving, keep on caring for people's needs. Be compassionate, be kind. Remember to forgive, remember to let go, remember to extend your life. And when you find yourself checking out and being selfish, give yourself grace. Wake up and do it all over again, amen? Because one day, our Jesus is coming back to get us. And that really is the simple message of Mark 2, uh, Mark uh, chapter 2, I should say, that tells us about we are to be witnesses. We do need a plan. We need to remember we are going to hit obstacles, but we need to always understand our role. Amen? God is with us, and he wants to lead us into a place that's much greater than what we are right now. Just don't settle can't settle. Next week, you're going to hear Pastor Glenn preach on part three and Erica preach on part four. We're just going to encourage you in the next two weeks about being that witness. What does it mean and how can you do it? Amen? God is going to touch you right where you are. Remember, you don't need schooling to cast a seed. You just need the love of Jesus. And we all have all of Jesus in us. Amen? All right, remember where you belong and who is your father. It is God the Father. Amen? Thank you for coming out tonight. Really, there's really nothing else. I didn't think of doing an altar call tonight because really, truly, this is just about a teaching to encourage you that you're part of the plan. Don't lose sight, all right? And don't become weary in doing good. Don't give up. Amen? God bless you. Thank you for coming out tonight.